We used to have a Zen practitioner who came here on a regular basis, who was planning to go back to school, get a PhD. He told me his plan for a thesis, the number two, and all the problems that come from the number two. I tried to discourage him. I pointed out there are a lot of good twos in the world. There's a passage where the Buddha describes analysis of qualities as a factor for awakening. It basically boils it down to seeing things in pairs. What's skillful, what's unskillful, what's dark in the mind, what's bright in the mind. Because those pairs really do make a difference. There was a famous translator one time who translated that passage and then wrote a footnote saying he didn't understand how this was the proper description for discernment. I guess he was assuming that discernment had to be seeing things in terms of the, the three characteristics. But the Buddha's wisdom teachings are all about twos. The two teachings that he says are categorical, are dichotomies on the one hand. Unskillful qualities should be abandoned. Skillful qualities should be developed. Now, sometimes those are two sides of one thing, but they really are different. What's skillful is very different from what's unskillful. The Four Noble Truths are basically a dichotomy. That's the other categorical truth. On the one hand, you have the cause of suffering and then suffering. And on the other hand, you have the path leading to the end of suffering and the actual cessation of suffering. Those things really are different. In fact, this is what discernment is all about, is seeing these distinctions, realizing that we have choices. This is what makes the distinctions important. It's what gives them meaning. In fact, if we didn't have choices at all, we'd be like machines, just running with gears, without making any real choices of our own. And there wouldn't be anything about it saying that the machine was skillful or unskillful, aside from the use that the person who was using the machine would put it to. Again, you get back to the person who's making choices. And these really are important choices. Look at the path. The Buddha sets out wrong view, wrong resolve, all the way through the wrong concentration on one hand, and right view, all the way through right concentration on the other hand. And they really are different. If you follow wrong view, he said it's going to lead to a lot of suffering. If you follow right view and carry through the other factors of the path, it's going to lead to the end of suffering. And suffering and not suffering are two very different things. So keep this in mind as we practice, that we're here to get the mind to settle down so that we can see distinctions, see where we're making choices and where we're making them in an unskillful way, so we can change our ways. If for everything we're all oneness, why bother changing anything? Why bother making any effort at all? We have to be very careful to figure out what is skillful and what's not. We have to look at things as causal processes to see where our thoughts come from and where they go, and realizing that we can make a difference. The Buddha gives us analysis, and when he talks about the causes for suffering, he talks about different kinds of craving. And the real problem or the real dilemma is the distinction between craving for becoming and craving for non-becoming. As he said, all cravings that lead to becoming are going to cause suffering. Becoming is taking on an identity in a world of experience. And that can happen on the level of the mind. In other words, having a desire and then thinking about the world in which that desire could be fulfilled, and then the you who is going to 
act to fulfill it, and the you is going to benefit once it's fulfilled. And then the you is watching over this to decide whether this is worthwhile or not. And you would think that the desire to put an end to that would be a good thing. But the Buddha says craving for a non-becoming, to destroy a state of becoming you already have, is also going to lead you to more becoming. Because you're thinking in terms of worlds and self-identities, even as you're trying to destroy them. And that leads the mind in that direction. So the trick, he says, is to see things as they have come to be, which means seeing the causal factors that lead up there. So instead of attacking the becoming that's already there, you look at the causes and try to develop dispassion for them. That's what dependent co-arising is all about, and particularly the factors prior to sensory contact, because those are the ones that are going to prime you either to suffer or not suffer, no matter what comes into the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And one of the important factors prior to sensory contact is name and form, another dichotomy. Now the question of form being skillful or unskillful, that doesn't come into the question at all. It's those mental factors in name. Those are the ones that are going to make a difference. You can use form, you can use the breath element in the body, but it's the name factors that are using it to make a state of concentration, give a sense of well-being. So the form factors can form part of the path. But as I said, it's the name factors that are going to decide what kind of path that's going to be. And the two really important ones are intention and attention. This is where the issue of skillful and unskillful plays itself out in dependent core rising. With attention, that's where you look at things. There are skillful ways of looking at things and unskillful. The skillful ways have to do with looking at things in terms of cause and effect. Unskillful ways would include looking at things in terms of whether you like them or not. And this is where you have to be careful, because as the Buddha said, sometimes you do unskillful things and it's pleasant. Or you're doing skillful things and it's unpleasant. You're sitting here meditating and sometimes there's going to be pain, sometimes there's going to be frustration. You can't say, well, I'll just do whatever comes easily. After all, Nibbana is a really relaxed state, so I'll find that way. my way to Nibbana by relaxing into it. That doesn't work. That's not the way cause and effect works. You have to look at the quality of the intention behind a particular mind state and then see where it goes. That's how the Buddha got onto the path to begin with, was making that distinction in his thoughts. Skillful thoughts, on the one hand, were those that aimed at getting away from sensuality, in other words, renunciation, non-ill will, non-harming. Non the unskillful ones were aimed at sensuality, ill will, harmfulness. And he realized he couldn't divide his thoughts in terms of his likes and dislikes. That's a misleading dichotomy. The real dichotomy came to, what, where do these things go? Where do they lead? Because the events of the mind don't just sit there. They don't just appear and disappear, arise and pass away. There's that passage where the Buddha says discernment is composed of seeing things arising and passing away, but it's a penetrative knowledge that leads to the end of suffering. Penetrative means that you see that some arisings are going to be good. In other words, they lead in skillful directions. Some arisings are going to be unskillful. They're going to lead in unskillful directions. So the discernment makes its distinctions based on that. So of course, what do you do? You encourage the skillful arisings, you discourage the unskillful ones. There will come a day when you let go of both sides. 
There's that level of knowledge that cuts through dichotomies. But to get there, you've got to develop skillful qualities. You have to hold on to this sense of there is a difference. Your choices do make a difference. They do matter. And they are real. If the Buddha heard of anyone who denied the reality of your present choices, or denied that they had any impact on the present moment. He'd actually go and argue with those people. He wasn't the sort of person to go around picking fights. But in cases like that, he'd say to the teachers that you're leaving people un unprotected. You're leaving them bewildered. They're suffering, and you're denying them any insight into the causes of their suffering. They're going to stay bewildered. And you're not protecting them by giving a sense of what's skillful and what's not, and how to make, how to see the difference. How to understand how to apply that framework to their experience. In other words, if you're denying the fact that people have choices, and that choices really do make a difference, it's really inhumane. He took it that seriously. So when we look at our own behavior. We should ask ourselves, are we treating ourselves in a humane manner or not? From the Buddhist point of view, it's that serious. And so even though on the level of name and form, you're going to be approaching that as you meditate. Before you get there, you want to look at the rest of your life, too, in terms of why you make choices. Are you influenced by your likes or dislikes, or are you influenced by something more objective? more in line with actual cause and effect. So likes and dislikes are the dichotomy that the Buddha is asking you to outgrow. And that's how children approach the world. And there's that big battle over what they will eat and what they will not eat. The things that are good for them, they refuse to eat. Then as adults, we can see that's a childish attitude. But we tend to bring that attitude to a lot of areas of our lives. We let our likes and dislikes get in the way. So it's really good to take this dichotomy seriously. As I said, the Buddha named it. The dichotomy between skillful and unskillful actions, and that's bodily, verbal, and mental, as a categorical truth. In other words, it's true across the board. And it's true that you should try to abandon unskillful qualities and develop skillful ones. That's true across the board as well. It's this insight that informs the Four Noble Truths, even dependent core rising. Dependent core rising is a teaching that the Buddha uses to resolve a lot of false dichotomies as to whether the world is a multiplicity or a oneness, whether the person who does an action is the same person who receives it. He cuts through those issues by pointing to dependent core rising. But dependent core rising has its two functions. There's the function of dependent core rising leading to suffering and dependent core rising leading to the end of suffering. So the fact that we are f free to choose courses of action, and then there are skillful and unskillful courses of action. Seeing that, that's the beginning of wisdom. And it carries through all the way. And it delivers you to the, the verge of awakening. That's when you can step off. Because at that point you won't be making choices that But otherwise you're going to be making choices all the way. <laughs>